Well, Americans around the country were glued to their television screens on Wednesday, providing terrific ratings for networks, but an otherwise upsetting visual for many Americans. This was followed with additional concerns about tech censorship after Twitter and Facebook took action against President Trump, and then further questions about our media consumption more broadly. So joining us now to break down the issues is Adam Gallette. He's the founder of the watchdog group Accuracy in Media. Adam, I first want to get your response to the media's handling of the moment that we saw on Wednesday. How would you rate the coverage overall? Sure, and first let me be clear. Reed Irvine founded our organization 50 years ago, long before even I was born. Wow. Uh, but I'll take all the unto credit that you want to give. That's right. The coverage that we saw yesterday was in many ways rare accuracy from the media, at least with regards to the visual rather than the audio. For once, we saw Trump crowds in their entirety. Usually they try to hide the amount of people that are attending a Trump rally. But for once, we got one of those good wide shots where we saw how many people were there. Those same shots also showed us that the overwhelming amount of people who were there were peaceful. And you, I think that you bring up a good point, too. I think that it's important to remember uh, that a lot of times with our media stories that the actions of a few individuals that may make the headlines, but it's not representative of really the people that make up this country. I mean, people are generally good. People are generally they have good intentions. They want to see the country progress in a way that we can all get together with. But this was a situation where the actions of a few people are now controlling the headlines. And I saw that a lot of people, too, were kind of comparing this to the summer protests when uh, a lot of the, of course, during the day, there would be normal demonstrations, chants, things of that nature, but at night it would then turn violent. Uh, do you think that that is a fair comparison? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, but with any group, we shouldn't judge them by the worst 1% of their membership. But what we should judge is how people defend or don't defend the horrible actions of that 1%. During the summer riots, we saw so many liberals coming up with justifications for the violence. We saw Hollywood celebrities paying the bail money to get rioters out of jail so they can go and riot again. Today, I overwhelmingly saw Trump fans and conservatives condemning people who broke the law inside the Capitol building. It's a great point because I also saw some videos, for example, where some of the people who were uh, crashing into the Capitol building were saying something uh, along the lines of the lesson is that violence gets what you want. Uh, they were referencing, of course, the George Floyd protests over the summer, and that's something that they were mimically saying. They weren't necessarily being genuine in the way they were saying it, but kind of saying it in a way to draw the comparisons to really what happened then when you did see, for example, violence result in some action in some cities. Minneapolis, for example, defunding parts of their police department. It's a conversation that's taking place in other cities as well. Do you think there's truth to that, that the way that the media, for example, allows something to happen one time kind of opens up the door for, if, the, if not the same behavior, something even worse to take place somewhere down the road? Unquestionably. Now, let me be clear. Individuals should be held responsible for their own actions, regardless of their political ideology. I always believe in holding individuals accountable for their own actions. That being said, the media unquestionably normalized violence this year. We saw fiery but peaceful protests that weren't actually riots. Well, when that happens again and again, you're going to get some folks who take that to the next level and say, well, if the other side can do it, I should too. Now, we should never stoop to their level, nor should we stoop to the level of outrage that the media has had. The media for years celebrated Bill Ayers from The Weatherman, who set off a bomb in the Capitol building. Where was that yesterday? Why didn't I hear the media saying a word about a man who mentored Obama, where Obama kicked off his campaign, set off a bomb in the Capitol? That didn't outrage the media, but some folks with Trump flags somehow did. You know, it's a great point, and it's an interesting one, too, that we're talking about it, because there are some people, for example, reporting that there are members of the Trump administration afraid that they may not be able to get jobs at other places or get those same media gigs that those in other administrations have gotten. And I think it's a fair point. I mean, you just laid that out perfectly, and I believe Bill Ayers is a, was a professor or something after that. He's gotten away with a lot over the couple of years, and now we see people like the Lincoln Project, too, people who were in the Bush administration, now have these very lucrative speaking engagements where uh, a lot of people are willing to give them money to make ads that really just they pump out one ad every now and then and justify it that way. But speaking of social media as well, uh, we saw that Twitter and Facebook are taking action against President Trump, and it was the biggest step that we've seen them make so far. It's not just a warning label. It's not just a deletion of the tweet or the, another button where you have to click and see it, but actually suspending the account, in the case of Facebook, indefinitely. Uh, what's your response to that? Well, it's outrageous. Edward Snowden summed it up best today when he said this is a turning point 
in terms of social media, in our civilization, in our discourse. We're now going into an environment where our tech overlords out in Silicon Valley who've never met anybody who believes in free speech, never met anybody with a conservative viewpoint, never met an evangelical Christian, they are now going to determine what viewpoints can and cannot be shared in social discourse. It's outrageous. And the alternative is conservatives and others are going to find their own social media platforms. But if we never converse with those who disagree with us and only speak in our own echo chamber, that's only going to increase divisiveness. They claim their goal is to prevent divisiveness, yet they're going to be the most responsible for it having occurred. It's such an important point because I don't think that a lot of people understand that when you take someone off of Twitter, for example, you are forcing them into another echo chamber, as you just laid out. And I think that is a big problem that we have right now is that we don't have the common square for debate. We don't. Uh, I mean, we, for example, uh, right before the election, a lot of people were asking uh, Democrats in swing states if they ever saw the Hunter Biden story. And those on the left said they never even heard of it before. Now, that's one thing that a lot of people could politicize. But what happens when we're talking about a set fact pattern? that you and I can have debates on, for example. We don't have that right now, and I think that is pushing people out to the fringes. So really, what does this come from? Does it come from the idea that people don't have faith in the typical media outlets, so they are looking for something else, or is there something else there? Well, I, you know, it's hard to say, but it's a tremendously dangerous environment we're headed towards. We're basically back in the yellow journalism age where they created salacious headlines because they know that newsboys could sell those papers much more than a newspaper that didn't have a salacious headline. So we get inaccurate news simply for the sake of clicks, and each audience is fragmented where conservatives listen to some outlets, leftists listen to other outlets, and we have an entirely different worldview of what's occurring in society. And now with the way Twitter and Facebook are handling things, we won't even be seeing those opposing viewpoints because some will be blocked and some conservatives will probably head to other platforms. It's tremendously dangerous for our society. And Adam, just to take that even a step further, I'm seeing right now that uh, the book publisher Simon & Schuster is saying that they will no longer be publishing Senator Josh Hawley's book based on his objection to the Electoral College yesterday. So, I mean, we're talking about things that are happening online. This is quite literally an example of a modern day book burning, if you will. I mean, there are books far worse than I'm sure that anything Josh Hawley is being put out there that are being put to publication. But once again, this seems like an instance where political affiliation is coming into play where it really shouldn't. I mean, when we're talking about the freedom of thought, the freedom of expression. I want to see the input of people that I disagree with. I think that makes your conversations better. It opens up your eyes sometimes to things that you haven't seen before. So I fear that that is the route that we're going down, exactly what you're talking right now about echo chambers. And we now know that uh, Joe Biden, for example, he got his Electoral College vote certified yesterday. He will be inaugurated on January 20th. Do you fear that the media won't handle that in the same way that it'll become an echo chamber of just what Joe Biden and his supporters think? Well, we know quite well that the media is going to love Joe Biden and they're going to do their best to keep Trump around just so they can have a, vi a villain in their story. That'll ultimately change if Biden isn't sufficiently progressive for them or if Biden appears to have a primary challenger who might come up against him. Only then will you see the media go in a different direction. Until then, we're going to see stories of Biden healing the nation, bringing us all together, and conservatives and conservative Democrats like Joe Manchin should just get out of the way and follow along with the progressives. That's what they'd like us all to do. They're activists. They're not journalists. No, and you know, I think that it's very troubling for the industry more broadly. I mean, right now we're in this political atmosphere where people uh, either want to make it pro-Trump, anti-Trump, anything like that. But there's a reason why people are searching out for other social media platforms or other news outlets, things of that nature. And it's because there's an underlying distrust in our media institutions. And I think that is very, very problematic. But before I let you go, too. What about President Trump? I mean, there's speculation that he might be getting involved in the media in some way, anything like that. Uh, of course, it's too early to say uh, there's no early indicator. But do you think that's a plausible thing that could happen post the pr Trump presidency? Trump is absolutely not going anywhere. I think that's the biggest reason he kept up this fight over the fraud, even when it was clear that he had no reasonable path to the presidency. A president who's defeated, rightly or wrongly, well, his supporters peel off the bumper sticker the day after the election. Yeah. And Trump knows, amongst anybody, that people like winners. They don't like losers. Well, if they don't like losers and you're not a winner, the next best thing you could be is someone who was wronged. So he's going to keep con con contending that. He's going to keep pointing to the irregularities and the potential voter fraud that occurred in all of the swing states. And he's going to keep his base fired up because he clearly has the next move in mind.
I think you're exactly right, and I think that's why we saw a lot of big name senators really join that effort towards the end because they know how far a Trump endorsement could really go for these people who may be wanting to run for office in 2024, such as a Ted Cruz, such as a Josh Hawley. So I think you're right on to say that. I don't think that we're going to see uh, any less of President Trump over the next four years. But Adam Gillette, the president of Accuracy in Media, not the founder. I don't want to date you too much. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you always for having me.